Good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Seafood from Scotland's Fishmongers Masterclass. Um, first of all, I'm Roy Brett. I am the owner of Ondine Restaurant in the Fish Market in Edinburgh, and uh, I'm delighted to be hosting this today. And we're actually going to be watching one of my seafood heroes um, and a legend around the, the fish block. And her name is CJ Jackson, a very good author, and also um, one of these people that is the unsung heroes there in the back, teaching people all about fish uh, technique, uh, to break down fish, all different shapes, all different sizes. And today we're going to be focusing on round fish. And um, to all the colleges that are attending today, I think it's fantastic. Me, myself as a chef, you're always still learning, 32 years into it. And to actually, um, like I was talking to a friend of mine the other day about this, is that you've actually got an opportunity today just to see how to break down fish in all different manners and how to utilize it the most. Um, we all never stop learning. And uh, I think there's nobody better than CJ to just show us how to get the best out of around fish. CJ, are you there? I am. Roy, thank you. That's uh, very, uh, from you, uh, it's a huge accolade and I, I really appreciate it. Uh, it's quite tough sometimes being a woman in this industry, uh, but I'm very proud um, to be uh, working at Billingsgate, but I'm particularly proud to be invited by Seafood Scotland to do this session today. Um, I'm really passionate about seafood, the preparation of it, uh, where it comes from, the sustainability. I'm based at Billingsgate um, and I'm really Really looking forward to doing this session with you today. So, what so, have you got on your uh, board? Sorry? What have you got on your board? Right, what I've got on my board, um, well, for my round fish, I've actually gone down the route of uh, the cod group, so the Gadidae fish group, which is a Latin name for cod. Um, and here it is I've got a cod fillet, and I'm going to show that really close to the camera. Um, and I've chosen this. This is probably, um, certainly down south, one of the fish that we um, eat a lot. I am filming from my kitchen in Kent today, and I would love to be up in Edinburgh. It's my favourite place. My family are all up in Scotland. Um, but for southerners and down in, in the south, we tend to love eating cod. Um, this is a fillet. It's identified by this white lateral line running along the middle. Uh, and it's got these green speckles. Um, and uh, it's, as I say, one of the most popular fish. What I would like to say, though, is welcome to everybody that's watching. We know there's a lot of colleges. Um, I met quite a few of the colleges, so um, please interact with us as, as much as you can. Um, and we don't know where you are. There's just uh, myself, Roy, and my fish, uh, but it would be great to get some feedback from you as we're going. Uh, so, going on to the next fish, um, Roy, this is the, the great Scottish favourite, it's haddock. Um, it's probably one of the most recognisable fish because uh, it's smoked, and when they smoke it, either dyed or undyed, they always smoke it on the skin. Uh, you've got a typical black lateral line along here and a black mark, uh, and that identifies that one as haddock. And I know if you do fish and chips, generally, mm -hmm. if I'm right in saying, fish and chips up in... Um, Hi from Glasgow, from Alex. Sorry, I'm just waving at you. Um, you can see things popping up on our screen. So if I'm right in saying, a fish and chips in Scotland would be preferably haddock. Is that a fair choice? Yeah, definitely. Like, you know, down in our, uh, our chipper, um, we, we, we use uh, the angel cut haddock. And I know that Callum from the Bay Fish, I told you guys up in Stonehaven, they, they, they use on the single fillet. And... Uh, just two different techniques on, on like the angel um, in Edinburgh. It's funny, like if you if you don't serve a like a whole fish, that people get a bit upset, even if you're serving the same weight. But um, I know that up in uh, Stonehaven, they're using the, the single cut, so it's just a single fillet. Right, right. Well, I um, and I don't. There's also a lot of discussion with fish and chips as to whether you leave the skin on, and I think for quality, uh, leave, taking the skin off is preferable. But today. I think the advantage of leaving the skin on for fish and chips is at least you know you're getting what you've bought and what you've paid for. 
one of our favourites at the school, um, and, and one that I saw quite a lot of on a, on a recent visit to Peterhead, uh, is this fish. Now this is coli, we call it coli in the south, up in Peterhead, a big fish market up there, uh, they would label this um, as safe. Uh, it's underutilised. Um, 30 years ago, if you went into a fish shop, you would ask something for the cat. This is what uh, you did, you'd be given. It would be coli. Um, it's um, very sustainable. I catch a lot of it. Uh, and you, if I turn it over, you can have a look at the colour of the skin, uh, of the flesh, I should say. It's an off-white in compared to the brilliant white um, of your cod fillet. So a lot of people generally avoid using it because it doesn't give you that typical sort of lovely white fillet. But I think uh, for fish cakes, fish pies, fish soup, it's a really good alternative. Uh, and it's also, because it's underutilized, it's not so expensive as well. So uh, for budgets, and we're all thinking about that, um, it's a really, really key fish to work with. Quality wise, heard. sorry, sorry, carry on, Roy. What were you about to say? I just had a question about the angel cup uh, fillet, and basically, what you're doing is it, you're skinning the fish and then you're cutting over the bones, you're taking the, the middle bone out, so you actually ended up with both fillets on both sides. So, the reason why it's called an angel cut because it actually just looks like the shape of an angel's wing. Oh, angel's wings, yes, we call yeah. it a block cut. That was from um, Russell. Hi, Russell. Um, I hope that answers you all right there, fella. Uh, no, so great. We've got lots of people. Um, uh, I can see people popping up on the screen just saying hi. Okay, so I'm going to move these, but quality-wise, when I'm looking at a fish fillet, uh, you know, we all know bright eyes, red gills, firm body, all really, uh, really key. But as soon as you've got the filleted fish, you haven't got any of that. So I'd be smelling it. I always get people to the market at Billingsgate and make them sniff fish. They always look at me slightly askance of that but it should smell sweetly of um, the ozone and the sea uh, and the other thing I'm looking for um, is a clear glossy skin uh, and the fillet itself wants to have a translucency um, and if I'm looking down this fish I can actually see um, the muscle bands running from top to bottom but if this fish is losing condition and it's been stored on say too much ice for too long the water actually gets in between the flakes of the fish um, and those flakes open up and you get what is known as gaping or bagging of the fish fillet. Um, these are a top quality. I've had them, I bought them from Billingsgate Market yesterday. They came down yesterday morning from Scotland. They've been packed on ice um, and important when you're storing a fish like this, not to actually put ice in direct contact with a fish fillet, only the skin. Uh, if you put ice directly, uh, you will get bleaching um, of the fillet and you get a lot of water. So I'm gonna move the cod fillet. Um, that will be a really nice thing to be eating a bit later. Um, and I'm just gonna have a look at the other fish that I've got here. Now, this is one of my, my favorites. Um, uh, Roy, you asked me earlier, which one of, if I had a favorite fish, what would it be? Um, and one of the most memorable meals I've ever had uh, was whiting straight off the boat. Um, it was, I bought it home, it was still in a state of rigor mortis, so it was stiff, uh, and I put it under the grill, cooked it, it was absolutely delicious, and it's one of the most memorable fish um, I've eaten. Uh, when I was a, a student, um, I was always told that it was uh, an invalid fish, so for somebody's not well, because it's very low fat, um, but I think it's, um, it's absolutely superb. And this is one of the fish that you do get block filleted, where you, you take the, the lugs off the fish um, and you end up with your angel wings. And I've certainly seen that in um, the Scottish, uh, Scottish shops. So would you, uh, would you use much whiting? Well, I, I've used a little bit of whiting this week for our fish soup. Um, you know, I don't, I don't use it as, so much as a prime fish. It's, it's, you know, it's kind of funny over the last 10 years of the, having the restaurant, um, the menu suddenly sort of formatted to, to what the, the regulars really like. Whiting down at the, the chipper, uh, I'd like to hear anybody else's views on working with it. Uh, we use it as a sort of secondary fish, not as a prime fish. Um, so we use it as a thickening agent for bua base, fish soup, things like yeah. that. Um, it, it, it's a shame really, um, but it, it probably doesn't get the, the yardage that it deserves, but it's kind of funny, isn't it? It's like when you think of different fish like pollock and cod, if they were named slightly different, would, 
with uh, Pollock have been the, the alpha fish and, and uh, cod. Well, it's, it's interesting, uh, actually, because, um, you know, we love cod and haddock, and both of those fish store really, really well. So you pat them on ice. Um, smoked haddock is fabulous. Smoked cod you can smoke, but cod is also very traditionally salted. Uh, and both of those fish um, have got really good keeping qualities as long as they're stored on ice and kept chilled. Uh, Coley and whiting lose condition very quickly. So I would say um, with those fish, they need to be eaten very quickly. As the next fish I have here, which is pollock. Now, a few years ago, there was a, a TV chef that just said, oh, pollock's the new cod. Um, and it caused a little bit of issue because they don't actually catch much of it. And um, I know that it's not one of the biggest landings, certainly in Scotland. Um, and what's happened to the price is that it's gone straight through the roof. Um, and we've had a lot of uh, issues recently at Billingsgate where they don't get it. And when it arrives, everybody wants it. Um, and uh, the price is more expensive than cod, which is, um, which is a bit of a nonsense, really. It's a beautiful fish, but again, like whiting and coley, I do believe it needs to be very, very fresh. Mm. And I asked for a fillet, they didn't get me that. They gave me this instead, which was a really lovely looking um, head off gutted fish. Uh, the, the great advantage of something like this is that once you've filleted the fish, uh, you've got the bones, uh, you've got the trim, there's all sorts of other things you can do with it. Um, I'm gonna look at my hake in a minute, which is this fat fish here. Um, but uh, certainly this is beautifully firm, this fish, uh, and I'm gonna smell it. <laughs> Can't smell anything. Uh, it's just actually sweetly of ozone and that's it. So do you use pollock a lot? Is that one of your favourites, Roy? I, I really do like pollock. I mean, you know, a, a fresh caught pollock. I, I think it's not the most forgiven fish. Um, I think that you, you know, you've got one day, two day, but after that, you know, it's not, yeah. it's not one that holds really well. I think it was uh, Michelle Rue Jr. said that, you know, pollock caught in the Irish Sea, uh, freshly landed and cooked that day was the best fish he's ever eaten. So, uh, Snap with whiting is exactly it. So it's, it's fish that, you know, they're gonna, are gonna store well. Now, before I move on to the hake, I did manage to get ling. Let me show you what that looks like. It's another big, big fish. Let's bring that over. Uh, and that looks almost like an eel, but it's actually ling. Uh, they catch quite a bit of this in Scotland. Um, uh, and we don't rarely get of it. In fact, we might, I might have to be criticised for that because it's one of the things that we have to, at uh, Billingsgate, actually order it because it's landed and I suspect it gets sent abroad. It's not hugely expensive um, and again, it's another member of the cod group. So if you come across it, uh, it's worth having a, a try. And I think like whiting and the coley, it would work really, really well in fish soups and stews. But it is hey, a uh, We've got a question from Joshua who's been asking, how has the lockdown affected the fish market? I'm just wondering, is that the fish market in New Haven or is that the fish market down in Billingsgate and Peter? Well, I know Peterhead. Um, we have Jess Sparks um, around, uh, who is our um, one of my, my uh, great mentors, somebody that I, I admire hugely, and he, uh, he works for Seafish and he's based up in, in Peterhead. So he might be able to tell you what landings are like, Certainly yeah. over the last couple of weeks, not all the boats have been out because, of course, what's happened is the general public want fish, but restaurant trade and all that's disappeared. So yeah. at Billingsgate, um, for the first month, a lot of people were on furlough. Uh, and then what happened is uh, they were trying to get everybody into a system of social distancing. And in that sort of environment, when you've got fish right in front of you, it's quite hard. When I went yesterday, I would say 100% of the merchants were there a lot of their fish was covered but um i don't think they weren't getting the same selection that they would normally have uh and we're relying very heavily now hooray on a british coast british landed product so there was uh, i i had a quick look i didn't want to spend too much down there um and the sort of the staples like farm salmon were there but certainly um there was a lot of well all of these arrived uh, and had no problem with them so i would say it's definitely had an effect uh, trade is probably split in half now, but it's a lot of members of the public are coming in and buying. And there were big queues getting into market yesterday. Um, I don't know whether Emily would ask Jess for us what he thinks about uh, Peterhead. Um, yeah. And then whilst we do that, I just want to introduce the fabulous Hake. Can I, I carry on cutting? Is that okay? Yeah, carry on cutting. Um, I think Jess is going to come on to answer questions at the end. 
have it. Um, All right. Well, he will give you certainly a good idea. Um, and one of the most exciting things, and I know um, that you're going to talk about this later, is one of the most inspirational visits I've had in the last couple of years, are two trips to Peterhead Market. Um, you know, I've been working with fish for 25 years, and it's a little bit sad, uh, but I still get really excited about a box of fresh fish, you know, when you're working with fabulous product. Uh, and Peterhead Market, the new market, is, uh, is fabulous. So Jimmy Buchan, um, who is the trawlerman, uh, he took me round uh, and I just got so excited by these great big 50 kilo boxes of fish. So I'd really inspire or ask, you know, people who are watching today, do go into the competition because there is a, a, a visit to Peterhead. And I know Rob will talk about that a little bit, a little bit later. Right, okay, so what I've chosen to cut, and this will cover a number of different techniques, is a hake. Now, a hake is actually not a member of the cod family. Uh, it's a, a different fish, very popular in the Portuguese and Spanish markets. That's the very first time I actually worked with it, it was in Spain, um, 20 odd years ago. Um, but it's becoming popular, and it's certainly, I believe, and I think Jess will confirm this, that it's about the fourth um, sort of most landed product now in Scotland, and Scotland's seeing a lot more of it. The other great thing about HAKE is it's MSC certified. So that's the Marine Stewardship Council certification. Um, and that uh, would be, now somebody's saying Jamie Mack is saying he uses a lot of HAKE. It's fabulous fish uh, to work with. Um, and it's something I think is good value and it's something we can be using more of. And I think Roy, you said that was one of your preferred fish. Yeah, it's been, you know, it's became really popular now. I mean, when I used to work down with Rick down in Padstow, um, he used to do like a, a hake and a butter bean dish. And, you know, at the time, it was, a, it was probably the, one of the first times I was actually handling hake on a regular basis. But, you know, we put it onto the menus about for the last three years. And I was always, we, we took cod off, we put the hake on and it actually worked really well. And it, the, the one thing that um, is always a surprise when you actually go to fill it a hake, which you're just going to expertly do, is that it's such a soft fish. The flesh is so soft. It's got such a high rib cage as well. And it's quite, it's not the easiest fish to, to, to fill it off. And um, I'm right in saying just now that hate's prime in season um, and a, like an alpha predator fish as well. So, you know, the, the, there's, there is a good catch going on just now that I've heard up in Peterhead. So, um, I don't know if it's a, are you, are you seeing a lot of hate down in, uh, in Billingsgate? Yeah, we do. We see it. Uh, we get a lot in from Cornwall, um, but we also get a lot in from Scotland now. And um, I use it a lot in the Scotland, but I, talking about the softness of the flesh, uh, it has hardly any rigor mortis. Uh, and therefore, um, I wouldn't normally give this fish to somebody that's never picked up a knife before, because you'll end up with something that looks a little bit akin to wallpaper paste because uh, you <laughs> lean on it and it's crushed. So you need to handle it very carefully. Um, and so I'm going to try and do that right now. Quality wise, um, we're thinking about bright eyes. Well, this fish, uh, the eyes look a bit sunk in and that's partly because when they pick the fish up, they always pick it up by the eye socket like so. Uh, and there's a good reason for that. Um, I don't really want to put my fingers in there, but if you look at the teeth, I'm going to push those right in close so you can have a look at those. Um, they are very sharp, but they also have um, a, a uh, an anticoagulant on those teeth. And if you catch your finger on there, anticoagulant stops your blood clotting. If you catch your finger on there, it'll bleed for two hours. Uh, so you need to be very careful. Uh, with anything, if you catch your fing fingers on any fins or, um, or uh, teeth, you must wash your hands. And I know um, a lot of fishermen who use things like uh, mouth rinse. I think it's, I can't remember which one it is now, but they dip their fingers in it because you do need, you can get nasty infection from that. So handle this fish particularly with care. So the eyes are a little bit sunk in, but the gills, I'm going to turn this fish over and show the gills. It has been sitting um, in a box of ice overnight. Um, ice can actually affect the colour of the gills, but they're still nice and pink and quite open. Um, and as I said earlier, quality, if you look at the softness of that, if you push too hard, it will pit, the skin will dip and pit in. So you need to handle it um, very cautiously. So I'm going to go on to the, the preparation and filleting of this. Um, and the piece of equipment that I need today, uh, first thing I'm going to use is a pair of scissors. Um, we need to trim off those fins first of all, uh, just so we end up with a neat um, of steaks and fillets. 
Um, I'm going to use my best filleting knife. Now, this is a particularly good knife. It's got a nice flexibility on the blade. The tip holds nicely on the board. Uh, it's about 18 centimetres for me, and that's uh, for, for what I want to do today. It's a good blade. Essential, as you know, that these knives have got to be absolutely razor sharp to get the best cut of the fish. Um, and then the other piece of equipment I'm going to need probably is a staking knife, which might help me when it comes to actually cutting a steak. Uh, and finally, I've got this implement, which is one of our knocking sticks, uh, which means we can actually cut through uh, the steak of the fish. So first of all, what I'm going to do is cut the or trim uh, with my scissors, going to trim off the fins of the fish, just trimming them level with the skin. Uh, and when you're trimming a fish, uh, you always want to start from tail cutting towards the head. Uh, if you uh, try cutting it the other way around, uh, the, uh, the, the, the fins lie flush uh, against the skin and it's virtually impossible to remove them. So taking care with that. Uh, there's also a fin on the underside. I'm going to just trim that level as well. Again, from tail up to the head. Uh, and then I'll just discard those. A lot of the bits and pieces that we can get from this fish today um, will be great for stock, not particularly interested in those. Uh, I'm going to trim off uh, petrol fins uh, and anything that's going to be in my way uh, and get rid of those. Leave the tail on, that's a key fin, but today we're just going to leave uh, the tail on that. Right, next thing. Um, is taking the head off. Now, what I want to do with this fish today is section it into a loin, and the loin would be between the head um, and where Roy was talking about the rib caging here. Um, I then have got just enough for this fish to take off steaks. Uh, these fish come in a range of sizes. I ordered a two to three kilo today, which is going to give me a, a really nice selection of portions. Uh, one to two kilo um, is fine. That's probably just flat um, skin uh, filleted um, is the best way to deal with it. But I have seen them on the market between six and seven kilos, big, big fish, like a sea serpent. And um, again, you've got opportunities to take steaks, fillets, and the loin out for that. Now, there's not a, uh, from nose to tail, there's not a lot of waste with this fish today. Uh, you can see it's already been gutted. They've taken that out. Um, shortly we'll be seeing um, little bits of hake roe, that's another uh, product that ends up um, coming onto market, so we'll see that shortly. Um, and what I want to do first of all is take my filleting knife, I'm going to try and arrange it so you can actually see what I'm doing, and I'm going to cut around this little section here. Uh, those little piece on this corner is known as the lugs of the fish, um, not hugely useful to me as part of the loin, but you can use those uh, if you take the bit of bone out, you can use that for fish cakes and fish pies. I'm cutting around the back of the fish into the back of the head, uh, probably not the safest way of doing it, but I'm just trying to show you where I'm going. So right into the back of the head on one side, turn the fish around. Remember when you're handling a knife, always put the knife with the blade down away from you. I know so many fishmongers who've left the blade like that, hand slipped and cut themselves. So always think about knife etiquette when you're working with this. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do is exactly the same thing on the other side. Cut into the back of the head of the fish, going to turn it so you can actually see what's happening. So I'm hopefully just about cut it to a point at the back here. Uh, I'm going to just use scissors just to snip that through because that skin uh, is going to be, uh, I need to break that off. So you can see, released the head and the fillet. Again, I'm going to turn this around. I'm, I've got the camera, so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm having to just make sure you can see it. So there's the head. And then the next thing I want to do is actually take the head off. So anybody squeamish, just shut your eyes for two seconds. I'm going to put my fingers in the eyes. I'm going to bend the head back and I can hear it snapping um, from the bone. And then gently holding the fish, I'm gonna twist and pull the head away. So there we have fillet uh, or uh, body ready to go. And we've got uh, the head with those little flaps. Now I'm gonna put these aside, but the head here, uh, you could use it for stock. Uh, things like a boy base, base, it's gonna be great but you must remove that black membrane. The black membrane, I'm gonna try and scrape a bit off in my thumb, um, will leave you with a very gray stock. So gills out, obviously, 
but all that membrane wants to come away. Uh, and then um, you will have a really nice little bit of um, flesh there for or the head to stop. These little corner bits, or my little bits of lugs, I cut those off and I use them for things like mini sliders. Uh, a mini slider being um, slang for a, a small burger. Okay, any comments so far, Roy? As I yeah, I, I just, there's, there's been a lot of uh, interest. There's a, there's a question from Sophie about Billingsgate Market. Um, Billingsgate Market, that's open, isn't it? It is open, yeah. I was there yesterday morning. It is open. Um, there's, there's strict regulations about you know, how many they allow in the market, but um, no, it is. It's, it's open and it's um, we would, I'm sure, um, we can arrange when we're all allowed out and to look at each other a bit closer, um, arrange anybody would like to come and visit that as well. Can I just say that somebody has asked about the cheeks on the head, but also about the collar. Now, collar's really interesting. Um, I was in the States last year and the collar of the fish, which again are these little lugs, uh, what they do is they take them off and I've had them deep fried. Um, I actually did them with the cod collar because in the market, uh, the trim from, the, uh, from a lot of these fish, these little bits here, get sold separately from the actual main fillet. Um, and they go to the Chinese market, use them for fish balls. Uh, you can use them for fish cakes um, and fish pie. It's a bit t t sort of twiddly to get them, fiddly to get them off. But uh, what you can do is cut that off. And I, what I did recently was I, uh, I rolled it, I deep fried them uh, and served them as part of fish and chips. Absolutely delicious. Uh, in the States, they use smaller fish. They use things like hamachi, which is a yellow tail kingfish. Uh, but yes, uh, that's good. Somebody else has asked about the cheeks. Now, cheeks on this fish are not very substantial. Uh, that's the paddy bit here, also known as the pearl of the fish. Uh, you could certainly expect to get the cheeks. There's a little bit of cheek um, on the whiting. Cod is the, is the most traditional cheek. Um, and uh, always a really good option. Uh, do you have much use for those in your uh, restaurants in Odin's? Um, we, we, we actually, we, we, we have uh, done the roast collar and uh, like the roast in the heads. It's, again, uh, CJ, our, our, our guys that come in here, they're, well, our, our guests, they're, they're looking for prime cuts. Yes. Which is something well, that we and this is the one thing I'm always saying to certainly chefs uh, that are studying and, tr and training, they are going to be taking over from us in a few years' time. Uh, and they are the ones that have got to, we've got to educate the public. Cotton had it, great, we've got good stocks of that pretty much, but we mu we've got so many fish. And do you know at Billingsgate, we can have up to 150 species of global fish. Now, I'm really keen uh, to get people to use British coastal product. Uh, but that's not always going to be realistic. Um, and certainly, uh, you've got the, probably some of the best fish you will ever get uh, coming out of Scottish waters. But if we can get people to embrace all those species, the hake, the gurnards, all these fish um, are really going to be great options. And it's the chefs who are going to be educating the consumer, which, as you know, put it on the menu and they don't choose it. That's the trouble, isn't it? <laughs> well, I've just had a, a question from uh, Kevin Dalgleish up at the Chester. Hi, Kev. Um, he was asking me for, for the hake dish that um, what, what garnish would I be using and at the moment we're using uh, Lunan Bay asparagus and the romesco. Uh, reason why we're using Lunan Bay um, again for the asparagus is that you know they, their, their markets completely collapsed due to um, the situation we're all in lockdown so what we're, what we're trying to do is uh, go through all the stages that who's affected from the restaurant right through to the grower right through to um the the, the supply line like brayhead foods clark speciality and so we're we're working with that product just now so I, th I think the answer to your question kevin is we're trying to support local seasonal growers and uh, utilize the crops that they've got for the short period of time so Lunan Bay's um, available now. It's got about another four week shelf life left on it. And uh, with the weather like it is today, they were telling me that the asparagus is growing 10 centimetres in a day. So uh, it's, it's a fantastic product. Hope that answers your question. Kevin. There's so many questions in. Um, people, somebody's just asked me about uh, what other fish. I think it's a New Zealand uh, species. I'll double check on that actually. Um, because uh, some, some fish have got a stronger taste than others. Somebody else, there's lots of questions coming in, which is really interesting. I'm trying to look at them 
Roy is fielding them a little bit better than I can. Um, right, okay, next thing I want to do is I'm actually going to remove uh, the, the page. It's also almost like cartilage, this, this rib cage. Um, and in order to be able to access that, not use my knife, but use my fingers, I want to actually open up the belly uh, using my knife. The fish has been gutted. I'm putting my knife in. I'm going to see whether I can just turn it around. It might be slightly more effective to do it that way so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, and I'm just going to gently open up the belly, just a little bit further down, cutting down one side. So gently cutting. You've got to be really careful um, how you handle this. So I've opened up the belly in order to reveal that little bit of rib cage in there. Um, and what I'm going to do today is I'm going to use my thumb. I'll just do it on one side just to pull back the membrane. And then having done that, I'm using my thumb to actually just gently pull uh, the fillet away. So finger in there just to release it from the bone. This way you get a really nice clean cut uh, and then you've got the tail to fillet. Do the other side. Well, sorry, what are you about to say? For all the years I've been, been working as a cook, I've never seen that technique before. Well, we do a lot of work with fishmongers. And a thing called the, um, uh, there's the National Federation of Fishmongers Craft Competition. And this is one of the ways they handle hake now. So I'm going to use my fingers again, just to remove this. I have a fishmonger who works with me. And when I asked him to do this first time, he was like, don't be ridiculous. Uh, never do that, Blotman would never do it. And then I explained to him that actually a lot of fishmongers do prepare the fish like this. Uh, he, he, he then did it for me and actually admitted it was a really nice way of getting a really nice clean fillet, which is uh, you're going to get your loins. So what I've basically done is release that. So easy, you just stroke the bone and it just comes away. So when I've gone down as far as I want to go with this, I pick that up and hold onto the fillet and just ease out that little bit of bone. It's snapped there already. So a little bit more easing, just to take it uh, right down to where the cut is. And then I'm gonna snap that back uh, and take, just twist. Again, be very careful that you don't crush it. And you then end up with the most beautiful, clean loin with your belly flaps either side. Um, I sold or saw these sold recently in a fishmonger as cushions, um, hake cushions, um, which I think are just cut into sections. Um, and what I'm going to do next, Roy, is I'm actually going to fold um, the two cut edges together and I'm going to cut the loin straight through. So a bit of trimming here, that would be going to go into a stock pot. But again, remember to, re um, uh, to remove that grey mm -hmm. membrane, take that out. Uh, you do need to remember where the, the, the uh, bit of bone is still. I haven't gone any further. I'm going to fold that. I can feel that now. And this is a really key part of being very careful with this fish. For cutting, I want to use uh, a big staking knife. Now, you don't want to saw it. You need to roll the knife. So I'm going to put the heel of my knife right where the lateral line of the fish is, pull it back, and then roll it down in one action without crushing it. Um, if you, you'd end up then uh, with a really nice uh, clean cut. If you push, you're gonna end up with something that's squashed. So you need to do that quite carefully. So that's a, a big staking knife, a rolling action. Don't saw, a rolling action is what you want. Now for the actual belly here, what I'm gonna do next is take off the belly flap so that we can actually trim up the loin. Um, and I'm going to use a, a long cut with my knife. Don't saw, lots of chefs saw, it's just, or fishmongers even saw, but I would try and use a nice cut it to cut up a can. And again, just, we've got a, there's your membrane. Sorry, CJ. Um, we've got a question from Victoria Cooper asking when hake is normally in season. I know it's just comes, it's proper in season right now, but when, when, when's the first point of the season? Oh, well, I don't think they catch a, a huge amount of it. Let's ask um, Jeff a little bit because he's going to be telling you when it's coming in. One of the things for me is that when it's producing a lot of rowers with a lot of fish, um, it's, the quality is not going to be good. And I think certainly going into the summer, we won't be getting quite so much. Uh, but I think it depends on Scottish waters and Cornish waters. 
So let's ask Jess uh, for his thoughts on that uh, a little bit later. Um, is that all right? Je the other thing is as well, I'm, it, look yeah. I'm looking at the chat and uh, so many people like myself are just like, wow, your technique's awesome. I mean, you know, it, it's, it, this is the most important thing for me is learning. And, uh, you know, just, just like Rick, when he used to go and do his travels, he'd always get excited about coming back from a fish market or learning a new technique. And he always has his little moleskin book and writing down recipes and things. And, you know, like, I think there's so many people today that will learn what your technique on a hake. It's just, it's, it's incredible. It, it, it's just it's so easy you know there's so many uh, great ways of doing these things and I don't know who came up with the idea but it certainly works for me and uh, we do a lot of it at the school um, okay next thing then next bit of belly flap so I'm going to cut that straight through and that belly flap again once that membrane's removed one of the things I would check with belly flap is that with a lot of fish um, it's caught in the northeast Atlantic they are prone to a little bit of fish worm. Now, this is clean. There's no uh, uh, um, sort of worm in there. You get these tiny little brown whirls of worm. Um, I tended to notice that we had more um, late winter, uh, and they were good. Perhaps that's another reason why they're not such a good thing to land uh, at that time. But it's, um, you just need to look out, out for it. Uh, if you look at the way they work with this type of fish commercially, um, in order to check for cod worm uh, or the fish, the worm, they actually can a light box to pick up any um, anything that might be in there. Anyway, I would use those for my sliders. I whip them up. People are amazed. You don't need anything apart from seasoning. So I put those skin out, skin off, um, into a food presser, chop it briefly, um, spring onion, ginger, uh, a little bit of chili, coriander, splash of soy and dip it into balls. And I eat freeze them at home. I also have a 16 year old who's not that keen on eating fish. So I whip them up and I add a little bit of sage and um, onion to that, uh, fry them and then cook them in tomato sauce. And he thinks they're meatballs. So <laughs> it's really plenty. <laughs> so. We, had a, we had a kid, CJ, we, came, we come at the restaurant, they've actually found out now uh, for the last 10 years, but uh, now, now the kid's 16. So in all, they were doing the uh, sole goujons and he was told they were chicken. So for, for the first six or seven years, he actually thought he was eating there. Uh, eating he was chicken. Eating chicken. Well, do you know, a lot of kids, there is a discussion, a lot of kids they discuss, uh, decided, thinks that uh, fish fingers are actually chicken. So uh, I think there's something there. Somebody's just asking about fish filleting courses, and I know that's something that uh, the guys up in Peterhead are, are considering. I could talk to Jimmy Buchan about how we can do that, because fish filleting courses is such a great way. I'm not trying to take business away from people who process fish, but uh, if you're looking at costs and budget, being able to cut your own fish is absolutely key. Right, moving on quickly. Well, I've only got 20 minutes, so I'm going to crack on. So what I want to do here is I want to take out uh, that main bone there. So at a slight angle, so I don't lose flesh, I'm going to cut down using a long sweep on that side. So I take one loin off there. Uh, and then the same on the other. So at a slight angle to avoid too much weight. Uh, it's just, don't worry about trimming fish. Um, you know, sort of so worried about taking bits off, but you want something, uh, what you know, what you're after. Right, that's got bone in it. So what I want to do with that is put that in my stock pot. Now it's up to you what you do with that. If I'm being really mean, um, I would cut those portions into two so you can get four cushions out of it. Um, we smoke it at the seafood school, a little box smoker and ready, do lots of things. And Roy, when I've gone on to my next bit, I'm going to talk to you about how you might, what you might like to do with this fish uh, today. Moving on, um, what I would normally do is actually just go straight through the filleting of this fish. But I thought I would put steaks. Now, I'm sure, Roy, you will remember years gone by when things like cod steaks you know, still on the bone, or cod darns were popular when you had the bone in. Um, you don't see them anymore. I know, it's a, it, you know, like, when hate, the hate dish that we did with Rick, because um, a lot of the books we just cooked out his books, it's quite, you know, we never, we never had the uh, recipe cards or anything. We just went to page 137 for hake and butter bean stew. And uh, he always staked his hake. Yeah. Uh, it was always on the steak. And I... Uh, God, way back in the 80s in the, at the Cali Hotel, that salmon was always as a steak, you know, it was, uh, 
and it had it was very unusual when you started to see it becoming on the fillet and you're just saying well this is this is quite different you know but, um, well it, i think we've the tr what's that that's what that has done to the consumer is made them frightened of bone uh, and i think you know cooking a lot of fish on the bone um helps retain a lot of flavor it also helps with the preventing of the fish drying out uh we spend a lot of time trying to how little time fish needs in the oven but as a fillet it's so for chefs, a different thing. You know what you're doing. But for people cooking at home, it's a, it's a different scenario. Well, that was um, Grant Ricky's question about uh, cooking on the bone and uh, the benefit. And it's just like fish, meat, there's, it's exactly the same process, isn't it? Cooking on the bone, it's a much better product. I mean... Yeah, you get the flavour, do, you don't lose the moisture. So We, we do a lot of hal, uh, halibut, uh, sorry, sorry, turbot on the bone. Um, again, just working at the seafood restaurant and you were uh, cooking like the, the turbot on the bone and serving it with a simple hollandaise sauce. I, I mean, there was, there was nothing, nothing better. I was wondering what, how um, also like Craig, Craig Miller um, cooks, I know he's on here today and how, how he approaches uh, cooking fish on the bone because he's a, he's a, he's a wizard up there in uh, St. Andrews. Okay, who was that? Craig Miller. Great, okay. Yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to hear what he comes back with. Um, so for staking this, if I was taking this like, um, say, cod steaks or a salmon steak, um, what I would do first was actually mark the distance, because obviously, uh, as you get close to the tail, you need a wider one to get enough flesh on the bone. Um, I'm going to go for about two and a half, three centimetre cut there. And again, you don't want to saw. So I'm going to put my hand gently on the edge. I'm going to put the heel of my staking knife just on the lateral line, pull towards me and push to there. Um, you've got bone, so I'm gonna draw the knife back and then using my mallet, just move it through a little bit, I'm gonna hit through from the tip of the bone to cut through uh, to the actual, um, to the other side. Cut through, everybody gets nervous when I do that. Cut through and then roll the knife through to take off Thank a really nice steak. I think we're all a little bit nervous, of you, CJ. Sorry. I think we're all a little bit nervous of you. <laughs> a friend of mine who's, a, who's a, a solicitor or a judge said to me that he sat before some very uh, furious judges in the past, and nothing compares to me. And I hope I don't give that impression. I'm actually quite a softy. So here, um, I'm going to just uh, what I would do with that is just lightly press it. One of the things that I used to do uh, when I first did my first fish book, which is 25 years ago now, is I would take that bone out and put a little bit of herb in there. Uh, you can tie it um, and or you can wrap something around it like nori and press it um, ready to grill or pan fry. Um, so if you want to get rid of the bit of bone um, or just grill it, perfect. Okay, so finally I'm onto the, onto the last section of this, which is going to be the filleting of this fish which is gonna work for any round fish. Um, and for filleting, I always use a cloth just to support the belly of the fish. And I'm gonna try and turn this, so you can actually see what I'm doing. Um, I'm gonna just take my filleting knife um, and I'm gonna lie the knife flat um, so that it's just lying on top of the dorsal spine. I have to just hitch over the edge of the chopping board. Uh, and then I'm gonna push the knife away from me to cut through the skin and then just gently take that knife all the way down to the tail, resting on the dorsal spine, going in probably, uh, put in a bit deeper than I normally would, about a half a centimetre or a centimetre or so, but don't saw. That knife should be sharp enough to cut through it straight through the skin. You then, in order to get the best amount of fish off the bone, you want to nestle the tip of the knife actually on the backbone, and unlike a lot of knife techniques where you hold onto the knife like that, I extend my finger up the, up the blade a little bit to extend the control I have over the knife. Holding onto the fish, I'm then going to drag the knife down just on that bone uh, in one long action. And what I can hear, you probably can't hear it, is a ping, 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 ping noise as you run the knife over the bone. So I'm going to open it up until I can see the actual backbone. And then I'm going to use a technique which is known as breaking the tail. And what I'm going to do is take my knife straight through 
to the other side of the bone. So it's lying on top of the bone, hold the fish there, and then just allow my knife to gently, don't squash it, but gently bump down to the tail. And that is known as breaking the tail. And then there's a tiny bit up here that's still attached, a long sweep to take that off so you can keep the knife as close to the bone as possible. So you've got your fillet there, it's so easy to crush it. Um, and you've got the second fillet there. I would then take the knife on to take the second fillet off. I think we're running out a little bit of time, but again, um, I would line the fish up there. Now, I'll tell you what somebody did ask me, was had I had we scaled the fish? And actually, um, I'm gonna skin this today, apart from there, um, and I'm not so concerned. Some fish I would absolutely scale, uh, but if you're skinning it, I wouldn't worry. Um, it's, uh, we, I do have a scaler in my kitchen, um, it's up to you. You've got to be very careful with scaling this though, because the skin's quite fragile, uh, and what you don't want to do is damage the flesh. Well, so there, Craig, and Craig's got... came back. Um, it's amazing, for one of the best seafood uh, chefs in the country, he said he used to hate fish when he, uh, he was young because of the, the bones. But uh, he cooks uh, the dobers on the bone, turbot, um, that's really interesting, Craig. Interesting, I must admit, yeah. I wasn't too keen on the old rainbow trout with the bones in them and the bottle of Matthias Rosie on the side. Well, I wasn't allowed that, but parents did. And then they put the candle in at the end. But uh, no, very interesting. So what I'm doing now, we just run the knife over that to take it over the bone again, to take off the fillet. Now there's still a little bit on there and I'm gonna pull a bit off with my fingers. And then you can see how soft it is. I can just crush it. As I said, wallpaper paste is a perfect example of it. You can scrape. Um, I spent a bit of time in Japan and after they filleted a, a tuna, they would then have somebody sitting there with tweezers pulling off the last little bit of meat so there was no waste. Uh, you could scrape off a little bit from there. Uh, I just wanted nice clean fillets, which uh, we appear to have there. So, so far then, we've got your two tails. Uh, you've, got your, you've got your two loins, uh, you've got your trim, and you've got your steak. Um, I just wanted to finish with the skinning of one of these. Now, skinning fish, uh, I want to try and get as much uh, yield as I can, so not wasting um, any of the, um, uh, the flesh uh, and keeping it as close to the skin as possible. Uh, with skinning, you actually want to make sure that your knife, I can see down here, that your knife is on the flat, fairly flat on the board, but your knuckles are free of the board. So when you're skinning, you can actually keep the knife flat. As soon as you move your hand in like that, you can't keep the knife flat enough. So I'm gonna be working with my knuckles free from the board. I'm starting at the tail end and using the mid section of the blade now, I'm gonna go in a little way, um, a couple of, say, um, five centimeters. When I get to that stage, I'm gonna to have to do a little bit here so you can see, mid section of the blade, and then I'm actually keeping the knife flat and using a scissoring action like that uh, in order to take the skin off. So hardly any action at all uh, with, my, um, with, with the sawing of the knife. So the action is push and then you're pulling the skin, keeping it really taut. And then you can see just how close, there's also almost a gloss and shine on that fish fillet. Um, I would only take the skin off if I'm using that in a stew. If I was using this uh, for roasting uh, or a crumb, um, I would probably keep, or grilling it, i keep the skin on to protect the fish. Now, uh, nothing gets wasted in my house. Uh, that little bit of fish skin, I dry that in a really low temperature oven and I've got a Labrador in training uh, for, for gum dog and she absolutely loves it. So I dry that so that doesn't get wasted. Um, there's very few scales on here, but it was a good question. Um, and so somebody says you're making this look way too easy. It is easy as long as you're really careful with the way you work with the fish. So there we are, all of your hake, bits for stock, your head, all the loins. So from head to tail, it's actually not gonna be a lot of waste from that. There's something you can do with all of that. Um, and Roy, finally then, about thinking about the, um, the staking of this and the portioning of this. Yeah. Uh, this is something I've been working on because I have a little local group uh, who I buy fish for um, and I usually give them between 150 and 170 grams of fish 
Um, and I think fishmongers generally tend to be a little bit more generous. So this is really awful now, but I think chefs are probably more cautious thinking about portioning. Mm -hmm. So what portioning would you do for your, for por for your restaurant? What would about, you we usually do 200 grams. Um, do you? All right, yeah. I'm very maybe a little bit bigger when it's on the uh, on the bone like you yeah. know you, when you're doing like a, a turbot steak it's, you'd be up about 285 um, okay. because of the bone it's just like interesting just for um, like on a hake what, what the, the yield that you're getting off you're, you're probably what, losing about 50 percent uh, the head's very heavy yeah and I could weigh it for you I'll weigh it now and we'll see how heavy the head is uh, this was about two and a half kilos. Let me tell you how heavy the head is, and you can work it out because uh, the weight of a lot of fish is always quite substantial. Let me weigh those pieces, and I'll tell you what I've got, and see what we have. Because the, the big, <laughs> the big thing, CJ, that we're all thinking about now is when we we have, you know, like we're trying to get active in our restaurants. We're um, you know, we're, we're looking at when we come back and how how we're going to come back after COVID, yeah. and you know, the margins are going to be really tight. Um, utilization of um, our, our own fish um, our, 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 um, from, from Britain is going to be so important, you know, so we're going to have to work really hard on our margins to survive. So I think it's quite relevant so that we, you know, you, you can actually work out what your costs are going to be. And like what you've expertly showed today is the versatility um, of the Hague and what you can do and it's just just now we're just about to go in as we're going into um a new chapter let's say of uh, restaurant life um it, it, i think it's going to be very relevant to to know what your costs are even more than before i know we we should all know our margins etc but now it's going to be more important than ever yeah really really key well interestingly the head weighed 800 grams so from a uh, two and a half kilo fish. I think for this probably you'd be looking um, at about 40%, uh, certainly on yield um, of cod, anything with a big head um, is going to be quite significant. Um, the worst things are things like dory. Um, I mean, you'll get 60% you know, loss on something like that. But uh, when we're thinking about margins and quality, uh, this is going to be such a key fish. Uh, and I think um, really, um, uh, really, really, really key. Uh, for me, I would say um, I've been in lockdown and on furlough from the seafood store for some time. And I would say uh, working the Seafood Scotland, Claire Dean um, has invited me to do this today, has actually been the highlight of my lockdown. I've been really looking forward to it, having a chance to plan it. And I do hope, well, we're going to do another one next week. So we're going to look at shellfish next week. Um, yeah. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. And I'd just like to thank Seafood Scotland for the opportunity to do this from, uh, from rural Kent. Uh, I, my heart's in Scotland. I'd love to be up there. My family are up there, um, but my work's here. Uh, come up so here. It's a bit hard. Just come up here, CJ, and, and open up a masterclass cookery school here. Oh, I love we'd, we'd it. We'd have you. We'd, we'd have you in a minute. So somebody said you've got midges in dark nights, but I, the midges don't bother me. I'm not so sure I dark, deal with all those dark nights. Having said that, I go to Billingsgate. At, four o'clock in the, in, uh, in the morning <laughs> during the winter and don't see daylight because I'm out at 4, 4.30. So, but you're very lucky to live in Scotland. You've got fabulous product. Uh, you've got all that fresh air. Um, hopefully at some point we'll be heading in that general direction. Well, quick, quick question there, uh, CJ. Um, I, I, I had the, the, well, we were the, I think Rick was the, one of the first restaurants in um, the UK to get MSC certification way back in the day when we were getting mackerel from Matthew Stevens in St. Ives. And then we did it up in Dakota and we did it in Ondine. So this is like MSC certification. And the question is, what's the purpose of fish being certified? Certified Is it to do with sustainability or food safety? So yeah, it is about uh, sustainability. And it's a really good question because the chain of custody, the way it works, and I'd like to get your view on this. When, when you, if you get the MSC, certification for your restaurant and then you have to buy from a certified supply line um, like um, M&J Seafood and um, certain fish uh, suppliers uh, have it as well but I actually came to a point where the fish that we were getting from Gary Welsh down in New Haven was MSC certified fish but he didn't have the certification 
So we made a choice to come off the Marine Stewardship Council, not because it's not a, a good body, just because it was, it was pointless for our restaurant. So I think it's a good label to look out for, but I think if you're buying from a responsible fish merchant, I don't see the problem. Well, do you know, um, the MSC is fantastic. Um, it gives a lot of people a starting point, but I also, I have a lot of dealings down here with very, very small fishing fleets that can't afford it. Um, and therefore, uh, you know, I think understanding where your product's from, uh, certainly it's a big um, MSC. If you go up to Peterhead, they have a list of the MSC landed product um, and they've got a good listing for that, but they're a very, you know, they're a, a good fishing uh, fleet. Uh, they've got uh, a little bit more um, substance. Um, but I think that it's more important to understand where your product's from uh, and, uh, you know, the integrity of the person who's caught the fish and who's selling it. Um, I also like to use the Marine Conservation Society listing. Not always very clear, but it's another thing. When you're trying to give people some tips and hints, uh, both of those are important. Um, but buying locally um, is absolutely key. So you Scottish chefs, you're as local as you possibly can to all those fabulous mussels and shellfish and all that peterhead and fish and everything in Fraserburgh, um, I'm very envious. Well, see you. Is there anything that, um, thank you very much. Some really, really, some really lovely comments. Thank you so much. Um, I know it's tough in isolation. Um, I've really, really enjoyed showing you this today. And I do hope you'll all come back next week and I'm gonna try and get as much shellfish as I can. And then Roy and I'll be working through what we can do with that. Well, listen, CJ, I, I absolutely loved that demo. Honestly, it was fantastic. I, I really got a lot from it, and I'm sure, like I'm looking at the comments, there's a lot of people who really, really enjoyed this. So uh, I really enjoyed chatting with you, and uh, I'm, I'm going to really look forward to next week and do some shellfish. It's actually quite nice to be on the other side, so I'm, you're not cooking, I'm just chatting. Uh, yeah, no, it is, no, it is. And, and I would normally be cooking it, actually, but, you know, we keep things very simple at the school because I do cook it. Um, and um, but I really really enjoy cutting fish these days. Uh, well, we're nearly out of time, Emily. Is there anything anybody else wants? We've got an end poll. Lots of different types of chefs, ages, and experiences. So please, um, hosts and panels, we're not allowed to vote. But if you uh, uh, if you'd like to um, do your end poll, then please come back next week. Uh, Jess Sparks um, doesn't deal with a lot of shellfish uh, normally up in Scotland. He's going to be dealing. Um, I think that's correct, Jess. Um, but uh, if there's any questions, perhaps we can field some more things next week. Um, and an hour goes very quickly. But um, so, thank you very much, uh, Roy. Great to work with you. Uh, and thank you very much to Emily and Claire for organising this um, fabulous opportunity for us all. So it'd be great for the social competition. Um, so let's let's see if we can get some uh, some fish dishes up on Instagram, and you know. Going, who, whoever wins, um, or if it's joint winners, going up to Peterhead once this lockdown's lifted and uh, to spend some time on the market. I hope, hope to that point as well, CJ, that we can all get together and uh, go up there um, and with Jess as well and uh, maybe crack a few beers as well and have some fun. Oh, I can't wait to get up there. You stop me. I'll even <laughs> drive. I need wants to drive to get my seafood Scotland apron. Um, I wouldn't I stop you. I'm scared of you. Well, it's your lockdown still. I think I might be stopped by the police saying, why are you going to Scotland? And I'd be saying, just to pick up some aprons. I think they would send me home. But um, anyway, um, really, uh, really great. And um, I look forward to seeing you next week. Roy, we'll catch up soon. Okay, take care, CG. All right, take care. Thank you, everybody, for joining in. Look forward to seeing you next week. <laughs>